We've looked at charts which use cylindrical projections and we've also looked at charts which use cone-shaped projections. And now it's time to take a look at a chart which uses just a simple flat plane. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 10 in the GNAV series. Today we're going to be taking a look at polar stereographic charts, which unsurprisingly are used in the polar regions for some pretty interesting reasons. The azimuthal plane projection has a single point of contact with the surface of the globe. In the case of a polar stereographic chart, this is either the North Pole or the South Pole. We then project onto the 2D plane as if we had a light source inside the Earth. This produces a chart with concentric circles for latitude and straight lines for longitude, and they all cross each other at 90 degrees, which is good for measuring angles but it does also suffer from a bit of scale expansion as we move away from the North Pole. Scale expansion occurs as we get further from the poles because the circles of latitude will start to become more spread out as we move further away. But it can be reduced depending on where we place our light source, if you like. And basically, the scale expansion becomes less than 3% which is deemed acceptable levels when we place the light source at the opposite pole um, latitude of 70 degrees. So for a north pole, polar stereographic chart, we would do it, do it at south 70 and for a south polar stereographic chart, we would do it at north 70. In reality, we can reduce the scale expansion even further in the same way that we did with the Lambert's chart by basically moving the plane inside the Earth partly, but normal stereographic charts don't do this. On a polar stereographic chart, the latitude and longitude lines intersect each other at 90 degrees, which means we can measure accurate bearings. It displays great circles as straight lines, and rum lines are curved lines always closer to the equator. And if we're on the same latitude, the rum line will just follow that parallel of latitude either purely east or purely west. The difference in bearing between the great circle and the rum line is calculated using the conversion angle, which is half of the convergency. We use the convergency calculated from the point of tangency of the azimuthal plane, which in the case of a polar stereographic chart is 90 degrees. It's either purely North Pole or purely South Pole, which is 90 degrees latitude. So if we plug that into our convergency equation, We've got convergency sine of latitude times the change in longitude. Sine of 90 just equals 1. So our convergency is just the change in longitude. So when we calculate how much the track changes from one point to the other, or we calculate our conversion angle, there is no additional factor to apply. There is no convergence factor um, on the change in longitude. It's just simply the change in longitude. So you can see that our great circle bearing x which is at point A, um, converts to Z at point B, which is X plus the convergency. There's no additional convergence factor to apply to the change in longitude. So if we take a quick look at an example. It uses a few different concepts and should hopefully explain things a bit more clearly and give you an idea of the sort of question you'll get in the exams. So a straight line is drawn on a polar stereographic chart from point A north 80, east 20, to point B, north 70, west 95. The track reaches its highest latitude at west 025. What is the initial great circle track to B from A? So first things first, we draw the effing picture. Okay, so I've drawn my concentric circles for the latitude. We've got one which is north 80, and for B is north 70. I've also drawn on a zero prime meridian line just to help with a bit of uh, ease of calculations essentially. We've got A which is east 20. East 20 is going to be roughly here and it's uh, north 80. So this is the, the line here. Let's call it there. So that's um, point A which is at east 0 to 0. Oh yeah, north 80. I know it's on that ring. So that makes that angle in there 20 degrees. Cool. Next point B is at west 95. West 95, let's 
call it, it's going to be roughly about here, isn't it? So let's go B, that's at west, 95. So that makes this angle in here 95 degrees. Cool. And that's the track reaches its highest latitude at west 025. So I'm going to draw that line on as well, and I'll just explain why in a second. So that's west 025 degrees. What is the initial great circle track from B to A? So it looks like we have a bit of information missing. Cool. So we know we can't use a run line in this case because we aren't staying on the same latitude. If we were, we would just find the conversion angle and in this case, add 270 degrees because we'll be traveling west to point B. This isn't the case though. We have to do something interesting with this additional information, the highest latitude of west 025, which is the vertex of the great circle. And this only happens when the great circle track is purely west or purely east. So on our straight line from point A to point B, we know that at west 025, this angle is 90 degrees. And the heading would be 200, or sorry, the track would be 270 degrees. So then we can use the convergency between the vertex and point A to find the great circle track at A. Okay, so this angle in here is 270 degrees. We're looking for this angle in here. That's our X. And we're gonna use the convergency between this point and this point and work backwards to find our angle at X. So our convergency just equals our change in longitude. And our change in longitude between point A and our vertex is 0 to 0 to 0 to 5, which is 45 degrees. And then we can see that in our drawing, the angle at A is clearly larger than at uh, our vertex point here. You can see that just by the uh, drawing, north always pointing to the center of the circle. The angle X at point A is gonna be bigger than 270 degrees. So you can just add the 45 onto that and we get our answer of 315 degrees. So initially it looks quite complicated but you've got this additional information and you should know that the highest latitude is always purely east or purely west. So in summary then, a polar stereographic chart uses an azimuthal plane projection with a single point of tangency right at the pole which produces a chart which is concentric circles for the latitude and straight lines for the longitude and they all cross each other at 90 degrees. Scale expansion occurs as we move away from the pole and it can be reduced to acceptable levels of less than 3% if we use the projection source at the opposite pole, 70 degrees, opposite latitude I suppose, 70 degrees. So for north, we use south 70 degrees, and for south, we use north 70 degrees. We calculate the convergency of the lines by using our formula, which is convergency times the sine latitude, uh, convergency equals sine latitude times change of longitude. The sine of 90, which is our point of tangency, is one, so convergency is just the change in longitude. So there's no additional factor to apply it's just purely the change in longitude. Great circles appear as straight lines, which are closer to the pole, and run lines appear as curved lines, which are always closer to the equator. And if we're on the same uh, parallel of latitude, our run line just follows that parallel of latitude around, either purely to the east or purely to the west. We can use our convergency that we calculated earlier to find out the change in great circle direction. We would have our angle at B equal to our angle at A plus the convergency, essentially. And then if we take half of that convergency, we can find out the difference in angle between our great circle and our run line. So is a polar stereographic chart the ideal chart? Well, it displays latitude and longitude, yes. Does it display accurate distances and angles? Yes. Does it have a constant scale? Yes, but only partly. Can it display high terrain? Yep, you can for sure put the color gradient system on this. 
Does it display great circles or rum lines as straight? It displays great circles as straight lines. And does it display appropriate information? Absolutely, we can definitely put on our symbols for air spaces and nav aids and so on. So it can definitely display appropriate information. So is it the ideal chart? Well, yes, but for polar regions, obviously, it's in the name. It's the polar stereographic chart. Hopefully you can see we have three main chart types depending on what latitude we are at. The Mercator would be for those low equatorial regions, Lambert's chart for the mid latitudes, and the polar stereographic chart for obviously the polar regions. And they all have different features and a few compromises made um, from the fictional ideal chart, which doesn't actually exist.